the seven ecclesias in Revelation, mainly because I, uh, I, I have not got an in-depth knowledge about it. So I'm going to just kind of share a bit of the history behind it, maybe some of the lessons that I have picked up from it. And then um, hopefully it'll encourage you uh, when you read through Revelation, which we have just done now recently with the readings, um, maybe you'll pick up on certain things as well there, which will give you encouragement um, as well or motivation. So first of all, the letters to the seven churches, they are in Revelation chapter two and Revelation chapter three. And Liesl had the privilege of going to visit a couple of these places last year, at least. Yeah, so we got the church in Pergamos, Smyrna, Ephesus, Laodicea, Philadelphia, Sardis, and Thyatira, uh, in, where they are now in modern day Turkey. And they were, um, these were written specifically by the Apostle John. So what I do believe these letters um, do is they needed to apply to the church at that stage when they received the letter. So they could hear what John was saying and apply the lessons to them then. But I also do believe that they do show, um, as one study that I was working through shows that they show towards different eras that as the church moved um, as well, which is interesting to look at. And then thirdly, I believe that the letters should be applicable to us and our walk in the truth as well. So like the three different phases, and I'm going to kind of touch on each one of those as we go along. But the letters to the seven ecclesias starts in Revelation chapter one, where we have this symbolic representation of the Lord Jesus in power. And I'd like to uh, read Daniel, I'm going to ask Liesl to read Daniel chapter 10 and verse five and six. And you're going to, um, as we work through Revelation one, um, pick up words that are very, very similar um, as they were in Daniel chapter 10. So that's Daniel chapter 10, verse 5 and 6, please, Liz. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Upaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Okay, thanks, Liz. So that is how Daniel described this vision that he saw. And here in Revelation chapter one, you're going to see um, a similar picture. So I found a picture like, you know, I'm very nervous of finding pictures on the internet. So this was the most neutral of pictures that I could find, but they still depicted what uh, we saw. So I will just work in no specific order because it's not the same as what it is in um, Revelation chapter 1, but we'll just work from the top down. So as Liesl just said in Daniel 10, there was the voice um, of rushing waters. And similarly here, we also have the voice like the sound of rushing waters. Um, rushing waters are always have got a powerful sound towards them. Um, and that can also then show towards the command, the, the position of authority this person has over uh, over here, I've said angels, over the messengers that were going to the, the churches. His eyes are like blazing fire. Um, Daniel described it a little differently. He didn't say blazing fire. I think he says like burnt torches. embers or torches. Right. Uh, so penetrating judgment. There are other references that if you've got marginal references that you can go and look at that actually can prove all these points. But now I'm just asking you to trust me. Um, for making the, those statements. Um, the face like shining lightning in Daniel, it says like a uh, shining sun here in Daniel, it talks about lightning. Also like a depiction of a bright light coming from a natural source. Out of his mouth comes a double edged sword, uh, which we know from Hebrews. Uh, Vuyo is so clever. Today she didn't bring her Bible. <laughs> 
Oh, it's go. okay. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse 12. Bill, if you can read for me, please. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than two edges. So, piercing, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joint and marrow, and it is this corner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. Thank you, Leo. I always throw it into the deep end. That was amazing. So there it specifically says to us that this double-edged sword coming from the mouth is the word of God. Uh, the hair, white hair, like the wool or snow, and uh, we know in Daniel chapter 7, it's referred to as uh, verse 9, it's the ancient of days. In his right hand, there are seven stars, which Revelation chapter 1 verse 10, the same um, chapter, yeah, Elise, can you read that for us, please? Revelation 1 verse 10. 1 verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Revelation 1 verse 10. Yeah. I don't know what, what reference should I have put there? Because it definitely says the seven stars. I think it's the last. Sorry, let me just keep my Bible open as well. Uh, verse 20. 20 sorry, okay. my problem. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Okay, thank you. Sorry, so that's Revelation 1 verse 20. It defines itself. I love it when the Bible interprets itself because mm -hmm. when we did mission work, especially in Zambia, and they always wanted to ask questions about Revelation, it was so challenging to say to them, oh, the only way you can understand Revelation is if you understand the history of Europe and if you understand the history of whatever... Uh, and they would have to literally do a history and a geography lesson before they could actually even begin to think of reading Revelation, which meant that a lot of them just said, oh, well, then I'm not going to read Revelation. So I firmly believe that we must rather explain Scripture from Scripture. And yes, it is applicable in history, which I will show soon. But um, you don't have to understand history to understand the Bible. Uh, so we was now the gold sash around his chest. Liesl did read in Daniel chapter 10 about this gold sash. Um, but we all will read for us from Isaiah chapter 11 verse 5. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Thank you, Vuyo. So there is depicting righteousness and faithfulness. And it's gold, which we also know is uh, tried faith. He's dressed in a long robe, which refers to purity. That's also in Daniel chapter 7, uh, verse 9. And then right at the bottom, his feet like bronze from a glowing furnace in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel also explains the feet. And we know when God talks about feet, it's uh, always moving about. Oh, it's walking and it's... Because the color bronze is brought in here, we know if you link bronze and brass uh, is often a depiction of uh, sin. So here we've got uh, the steadfast walk towards victory over sin. And those references in Numbers 21 verse 9 is Nehushtan. Remember Nehushtan was the snake, that bronze serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness. And they had to look at it. And then... Um, in John 3, verse 14 and 15, I don't know, would uh, Liesl will quickly find that for us. So in, remember, you weren't saved by just looking, if you'd been bitten and just looking at the snake. You had to look in faith at the snake, believing you would be healed. And that is emphasized in John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, so that you're bringing in the Son of Man, Jesus bringing salvation, and comparing it to the time when um, the serpent was lifted up and bringing healing to the people. So that is uh, the person that is describing this vision and giving the, the letters to John. 
But what also makes it interesting is when, with each church, it refers back to this vision of this uh, person that we've, uh, of Jesus, that we've just seen in Revelation chapter 1. So when he gives the letter to Ephesus, that's in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, um, you, the one who holds seven stars in his right hand, walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. That's linked to Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. Smyrna, in 2, verse 8, is linked to chapter 1, verse 11 and 18. The first and the last, <coughs> that's the Alpha and Omega, which was dead and is alive. That's in verse 18. When he writes the letter to Pergamos, that's in chapter 2, verse 12. He links it to chapter 1, verse 16, the sharp edged, the sword with the two edges. In Thyatira, in 2, verse 18, it's linked to Revelation chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Eyes like flames of fire and the feet like fine brass. He's linking those two depictions. Um, Sardis in chapter 3 verse 1, he links with Revelation chapter 1 verse 16, the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. In Philadelphia, chapter 3 verse 7 is linked to Isaiah to Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 where it's holy and true, has the key of David, uh, the door which uh, shuts and no man opens, and vice versa, and that is also linked to Isaiah 22, verse 22. And then Laodicea in chapter 3, verse 14, uh, is linked to Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 18, where it says, Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. So it's no coincidence that in Revelation chapter 1, we have this description of the glory of Jesus and then all those different aspects of the, the, the person that's mentioned in chapter 1 is then applied in and to every single church um, that we are going to now look at the different letters. So you can already see there's like, like such harmony happening over here. Another nice interesting thing. Yeah. So what we're going to do is, this is, remember I said to you, I believe that uh, this study I came across and I thought was really interesting in that the letters were applicable to the churches as they received the letters, but they are also, there's a progression and it's applicable to how the church moved um, and the, the, the progression and the development of the church. So what we, we're going to do, look at the summary here, um, and I'm not going to read chapters two and three, we're going to look at it as a summary over here now. So Ephesus, they linked to the apostolic church. That's you would read in Revelation two, verse one to seven, and they link it to the era of AD 30 to AD 100. So soon after, um, Jesus had ascended up to heaven, so they were commended for their good works, their labor, their patience, and they hated the Nicolaitans. Because remember, it's new, it's exciting, everything, and everyone's wanting to do preaching. But they are condemned. So you can see on the side, there's commendation, condemnation, counsel, and ch challenge. Each, uh, each church has a similar, the letters have a similar structure. Their condemnation is that they have left their first love. In other words, they are not as passionate or as excited about it as they were. Then the counsel is remember from where you are fallen and repent. And the challenge is to him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life. So they are very highly commended, but there is... Um, like this warning that they are losing their first love, most probably towards the AD 100, and, but they can eat of the tree of life. Then the next phase that the church moved into was, can be found in the letter to Smyrna. And this is in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 to 11, and they call this the persecuted church. So this was kind of AD 100 to... Um, 
they are commended for the works, their tribulation, and the poverty. They, um, they condemned. There's absolutely no condemnation towards Smyrna because they were people that were trying to stand up for the truth, but they were in an era where um, they had, uh, the Romans had taken over. There was a lot of um, challenges coming from other religions and again, persecuting the church. Their counsel was for them to not fear and to carry on being faithful. And their challenge was that to him that overcomes, they will not be hurt by the second death. So very much, you can see a church that was really having to um, stand up to external forces that were happening in the environment around them, especially from uh, the Roman Catholic side where um, if you read in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, you can see how they were persecuted because they were not following social or religious customs. Then the next uh, letter is to Pergamos, which is in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 to 17, and that links with the era 8312 to 606. And this is known as the compromising church or the indulged church. Um, this was taken place during uh, the Dark Ages, and where a lot of people were. Um, they were also being persecuted, but they kind of decided, well, how can we avoid persecution? Well, we will tolerate, you know, what, what's so bad about accepting this religion or why don't they specifically say at this time period, this is when celebration of Easter, Christmas, Halloween, Trinity, and the immortal soul beliefs came in. Um, and they were allowing these traditions and things to come into the church because it actually came to a point there, if you didn't agree with it, you couldn't get a job or you couldn't buy and sell. So also persecuted, but now they finding ways to overcome the persecution. So their condemnation was, I know your works, I know you hold fast to my name, and I know you have not denied my faith. But yet the condemnation is, you have false teachers of Balaam and the Nicolaitans amongst you. The counsel is to repent, and the challenge is to him that overcomes, I will give the hidden manna and a white stone. Now, I haven't gone into depth like with each of why that's the, what that uh, overcomes mean, that uh, kind of gift that they would get means. And I think there's quite a lot of uh, hidden depths there as well, why specific things are mentioned. From Pergamos, we move to Thyatira. Now, this is the AD... 606 to the time of the tribulation. This is now the, the, the pagan church, the totally corrupt church. Um, I, I'm talking like in the, the truth itself. It was, they commended for their good works, for their love, for their service, for their faith, and for their patience. Yet, they condemned, they allowed Jezebel to teach idolatry and compromise in the church itself. Uh, the counsel is to those, there's a few that please hold fast on what you have until I come. And the, the, to him that overcomes, we will give the millennial leadership and the morning star. So you can see that they have moved from just having false teachers to allowing idolatry and compromise to be taught in the church itself. After Thyatira, well, you all, everyone knows, if you start allowing all kinds of different beliefs in your church and you, there's not some steadfast thing, some rock you can hold on to, well, um, things just start falling apart. So we now get Sardis, that's now from AD 1, 15, 20, and right up to the Protestant Reformation. And this is kind of known as the dead church. Um, time period. <coughs> so Sardis uh, was so from early 16th century right up until the early 20th century. It had um, 
works. It had knowledge. It had a name that it lived, but it was all appearance. It only had the name because look at the condemnation. You are dead. So they were doing something by name only. It was not in their works. The works were not complete. So it was a very busy, busy, busy church, but they were busy with uh, the wrong things, the appearances, right? So the counsel is watch, just watch and strengthen the things that remain. Remember to hold fast and repent again to Sardis. Hold fast and repent. And the to him that overcomes will be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot his name out of the book of life. So all these, um, to him that overcomes, all you can see kind of refer to millennial um, time when Christ will return. From the dead church, we now move to Philadelphia. And I mean, with Christadelphia, we know the word means love. So it's the church that Christ loved. So this was now from AD 1750, right up um, onwards. And Philadelphia is similar to Smyrna, not one word of condemnation. What does uh, Jesus say to them? He says, I know your works. I know your missions. I know you are a small church. You've kept my word. You've not denied my name. They've been a small but powerful church, even though they've also been persecuted or even though they have um, a lot of, uh, they're in an environment where they could get destroyed. They have stayed strong to always uh, preach the word. The counsel is to hold fast on what you have. Doesn't matter how small you are. You, this, it just stays strong. Um, you're not dependent on numbers, which is what one can be very thankful for. And the a challenge was to him that overcomes, I will make him a pillar and write upon him the name of God and my new name, which is an amazing reward to work towards. And then Laodicea, which is where we're now talking about the time that we are in, it's the lukewarm church. Look at that. They are not commended for anything. Nothing good is said about them. They are condemned. In You are lukewarm. You are wretched. You are miserable. You're poor. You're blind. You're naked. It immediately makes me think of that time when Jesus said, that, you know, uh, when he was judging that parable, and they say, Lord, when did we see you naked? When did we see you hungry? And Jesus says, as much as you did it to the least of these, my brethren. Um, similar words that are being uh, used here. So Laodicea was a very um, independent church. I'll refer to it a bit more again just now. But it's a time where people were all told, you know what, you you've got brains, you can think. So there's this intellectual sophistication amongst them. And it doesn't mean academics doesn't make you spiritual. And that's possibly the challenge here. They were thinking that they could intellectualize actions and traditions and beliefs um, and move away from the genuine, what the word was saying. Um, and they were actually disobeying God. I mean, those are pretty massive condemnations to have yeah, mentioned to you in a letter. Their counsel was to buy gold, tried by fire and white raiment, to anoint their eyes. In other words, open them up, fix them up, get the illness out of them, um, see what's actually happening, become zealous and repent because there was nothing wrong, but they were worshipping God on their terms. They were now doing a religion, um, practicing it the way they wanted to. And to him that overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. So I thought that was very interesting how the different letters um, actually could depict the different eras in which the church was and ha is finding itself. And we pretty much are like, I would say, Philadelphia and the Laodicea um, time period. 
But there was even another interesting study I came across. And this is how, what made it interesting to me is <coughs> revelation is like a telescope. You know, you, they, you get something written and then a few chapters later, it's expanded a little more. So we call it almost like a mirror uh, that you get in revelation. Um, and, and that's why it makes it so difficult to understand revelation because you never know. It, it's not a necessarily a, what do we call it? Like a, 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 a moving one step to the next step to the next step. It's all these things folding into one another. But just look how interesting this is, how there's almost a circle in these letters. Ephesus, which is the first church, has got very strong correlation to Laodicea, which is the seventh church mentioned. They've got a common theme. Ardor, which means passion, uh, gives way to lukewarmness. So just as Ephesus was um, condemned for abandoning their first love, their first passion, Laodicea says they've got zero passion. They're neither hot, neither are they cold. If we look at the second church, it correlates to the sixth church, which Smyrna and Philadelphia, their common theme is faithfulness. Remember, they're the two that were not condemned. Um, both of them had, they had, Smyrna had problems with false Jews, where Philadelphia had the victory over the false Jews, but both of them have a crown of life promised to them. And then your third church, Pergamos, correlates to your fifth church, which is Sardis. Uh, and there's a common theme of their living faith are threatened. Both of them are almost classed as your dead churches. Uh, Pergamos was threatened by the apostasy, the Roman Catholic era, and uh, Sardis is threatened by formalism. Um, looking, you know, lots of rules and regulations, doing lots of things, following traditions, but actually not having a heart. And Thyatira, which is in the middle, um, is the church that is in spiritual darkness, its entire history into the depths of Satan. It says the, that's where the seat of Satan is. So an interesting thing to, you know, you always, every, as Brother Dennis Gillett always said, every word in the Bible is important. And to me, even, the order, the way that things are, is also important. And why were certain things written in certain places? And why were certain comparisons used? And I think, you know, we can apply this to our own lives. Often you can suddenly think, why was I there at a certain time? Well, God wanted you there at a certain time. And this is how God works. And I think through this, he also shows us how he even works through scripture. So I found that really um, interesting as well. Another interesting, um, if you compare Revelation 2 and 3 to Revelation 21 and Revelation 22. So I'm giving you like a whole lot of background. So you can, uh, when you do go and look at these things, you know, you'll pick up these little gems as you read through Revelation and uh, not just see it as a book of prophecy, but actually to see it as one where we can learn many lessons. So Revelation chapter two and three is very much about the church being counseled, how they're being scattered and how they're at war within themselves and with their environment. Where Revelation 21, 22, the last two chapters in Revelation, it's the church is rewarded, it's gathered and it's at peace, but you've got the same language that is used. Um, you can see as we go down on that church council scattered in that wall, there's the face that shone like the sun. Jesus was amongst the candlesticks. There's the tree of life was mentioned. There's the open door. We read about the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and we read about Jesus sitting on God's throne. And in Revelation 21 and 22, again, the glory of God illuminates the city. So there's no need for the sun because glory of God was shining. The lamb is the light, also mentioned in 21, 23. We have the tree of life mentioned there, the gates that are never closed, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, and God's throne and the lamb sitting on it. So even though the two periods are totally different, they've got very similar you know, characteristics that are coming out in both of them. I found that quite interesting as well. So looking now 
finally at the different churches in particular and what the church was encouraged to do. So again, Ephesus, remember they'd lost their first love. Ephesus was actually the main city in um, Asia. And I think it's still the capital city. city. Lisa says well, it's a very, That's yeah, it's a very uh, pretty city. So it, it was the leading city um, in Asia Minor at that time. Um, but they lost their first love for God, the truth, the work, and the brethren. Um, and in place of these key kind of fundamentals, the people were just listening to deceptive doctrines. And this is an interesting thing for me that we can maybe take to heart. Because for some people, holding on to a position in the church was more important than holding on to the truth itself. So it was far more important for them to uh, being um, a church leader or to have a position of prominent prom prominence than to actually just be offering acts of service. And the lesson that came across from Ephesus that we can take to heart in our own ecclesial environment is get back on track and just do the work. Preach the gospel with a zeal, love the truth and love each other. Don't look around. Oops, see, yeah, I'm going to push the wrong one. Sorry. There we are. Second church was Smyrna. Now, remember, Smyrna was um, also, it was a bustling and a beautiful city. It's on the uh, port city, so it's on the harbor. And um, many, they believed in the correct things. So they believed in the millennial reign. They believed that Christ was returning to earth. But remember, they were the persecuted church because this is where uh, the Romans came in, Saturnalia and Brumalia. Um, the, the church itself didn't believe in uh, the immortal soul. They kept the Sabbath, they kept holy days, they followed certain dietary laws. And this was making other people stand up and stick out. And they were persecuted um, because they were not following social and religious customs, the status quo. And as said earlier, remember, Smyrna did not um, receive any correction. And their lesson that we get from them is just remain faithful in trials and endure to the end and do not give up. And especially in the days that we are living in now, there are so many distractions around us. There is so much... Um, mediocrity and so much average and people are all saying to you oh but you know why do you have to do certain things it's so much you know you can just do things why do you have to um oh, i don't know have to have church every sunday well you know you can have it any time it's, it's important to have routine and it's important to uh, limit distractions and things that can possibly uh, just maybe become a little bit more uh, important and make you more accepted by society um, and just always test it against the word. Pergamos, this was now the time when the Roman church started dominating Europe and as I said Easter, Christmas, Halloween, the Trinity and the mortal soul were now absorbed from paganism, which was around them, into uh, the church. Uh, people were very intellectually sophisticated and human reason and the desire to be uh, progressive um, started allowing people to abandon fundamental biblical truths. So, you know, you started accepting things all around you. Um, why do we need to be so hard and fast, you know, as long as people just love Jesus, they can just, we can, you know, we can fraternize. Um, and there's the, there's the lesson. Do not tolerate false teaching or those who promote them. Compromise causes people to stumble and we must always stand for the truth. Uh, it's, I found all these runes fascinating because you kind of look at them and you sit and you think at one stage that was a very impressive temple. And I presume they're pretty big, hey, at least mm -hmm. when you went to see them. And now it's nothing. It's just a couple of pillars. 
that are standing around. Then we had Thyatira, and remember they were in the absolute darkest of dark periods. So they were the corrupt church. All this pressure from the environment and the society caused them to compromise their belief in order to just avoid persecution. And for some of them, it was just to actually get work and to live. Um, we are specifically told in other scriptures that at the time of the end, many professing scriptures will, uh, Christians will be deluded into accepting false but fashionable religious beliefs because either they did not know the truth or they are just willing to compromise the truth they once know. And we all know that spiritual compromise leads to spiritual corruption. So the lesson for us, question the status quo. Do not pretend to go along with false teachings just for appearances sake. Do not compromise the truth. Do not go back into ways you've been called out of or you will suffer tribulation. You might think you're avoiding tribulation, but you are actually moving yourself straight back into a position of tribulation. The next church is Sardis, a dead, busy church. Now, Sardis was very famous for its arts, its crafts, its wealth, and that's why there was this air of sophistication around. And how often do we not get caught up in that, where you, know, you, you talk a certain language just to impress people, where actually, I mean, I think it comes down to almost living a life in debt, where people see the external, but they actually don't realize how people are struggling to survive beyond that. So we've got similar warnings. Uh, many believers at the end time are going to turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And here's the lesson for us. Don't let the truth die. Hold on to the truth you've been given. Bear fruit with this truth or you will be blotted out of the book of life. Not uh, something any of us uh, would like to have happen to us. Then we come to Philadelphia. It just makes you feel happy when you hear the word Philadelphia. <laughs> just love. So now Philadelphia was um, not a wealthy city. It was not a sophisticated city. It wasn't even an influential city. It was actually a very insignificant town, um, which was on the route, the main highway, where people could meet um, from the surrounding regions. But... It was also a city that's constantly destroyed by earthquakes, but it was always rebuilt. And it is the one city that still exists today. And similarly, um, the lesson for us there is we, mustn't, we can't afford to drop the ball, uh, especially now when we know the return of the Lord is so near. So we need to remain faithful to the truth. We need to do the work of preaching the gospel, loving our brethren, so that no one will take our crown of promised reward. And then the last city, Laodicea, which is such a sad uh, city, but again, is so um, applicable to the way uh, many churches function nowadays, and especially here in South Africa. It comes across as very sophisticated and self-sufficient. It's got many independent-minded people who actually are rejecting the leadership of Jesus because they are doing their own thing. They uh, make decisions with um, doctrine, organization, how the church is going to run, how they're going to do their mission work how, and methods um, without getting advice from the scriptures and following the lessons we've learned there. And then this uh, lukewarm attitude is prophesied to be dominant now at the time of the end. And the lesson is for us is very urgent that Laodicea gets. Wake up before it's too late. Ask God to open your eyes to see your own spiritual condition. Repent of complacency, compromise, materialism, and stubborn independence, and respond to the leadership of Jesus Christ so you do not lose your reward. And how much should that give us encouragement to work even harder in um, spreading the word, especially now um, in the, these times where many people are finding life very, very challenging. So those are the lessons for us to apply with our church and in our church. But 
a church is made up of people. So here are some messages for us from Ephesus. To keep our love for God alive by prayer, by studying the word and working in his vineyard. The more you're working for others, the less you have time to think of yourself. So you know, just keep uh, busy, but not for busy busyness sake. Smyrna it encourages us to be courageous in the face of challenges and difficulties. In Pergamos, to resist the ease of yielding to compromise and complacency, to just kind of fit in with the crowd, to have many friends. You know what, just test it against the scriptures. Thyatira, when we mix with people with whom we share the gospel, always focus on keeping your faith and commitment to God pure. So be careful of your company that you are happy to keep with. Are you happy with the conversation? Are you happy with the words they use? Are you happy with the things they share and recommend? In Sardis, make sure that your faith does not become commonplace or just routine and following formalities, going to church for church's sake or you know, doing the reading so that you can just tick it off to say, yep, I've done them. Philadelphia, to take advantages of the opportunities Christ presents to proclaim the gospel to the best of your abilities. And Laodicea, to not be satisfied with your spiritual state and constantly be preparing yourself for the return of Christ. And these are important things that we can have a look at, giving us instruction to, uh, to, to guide us and guidelines in our lives, not just for ourselves, but I believe also with our families, our direct circle of influence, then moving out to our ecclesia, and eventually it will be working in our uh, communities as well. And then this will all um, be bring glory to God in the end. So my final prayer is this. Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And even as I was typing that in, it made me think of the serenity prayer. That, that if we, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. We can't change things that are happening in the environment but we have got the courage to change the things and respond in ways that are going to be scriptural. And the wisdom, to know the difference, we can only get that wisdom by um, reading God's word because then we have got something to compare um, and judge what's happening to us in the world according to what God wants us to do.